Hello and welcome to this meeting of the Aaron and her missionaries. Amen. Amen. Come on in, John. <clears throat> We'd like to say to you that we are a group of missionaries uh, that meet on Sunday nights here in Shepherdsville, Kentucky. And we've got our address here. Well, that's my home address, but uh, just give us a call or write us or email us. And uh, we'd be glad to give you directions in here to come and be with us on Sunday evenings at 545. And we always say to each other when we think of it, Maranatha, which means come Lord and add to it, come quickly. Mm -hmm. You see, that's why when the Lord taught us how to pray, he said to, to pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. For you see, the Lord's kingdom is not here on the earth because our king is not here. Mm -hmm. Our king is where the kingdom is mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we're looking forward to come. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've seen enough of this world to last me for my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to the kingdom that is to come. Mm -hmm. So the question posed to you today, sir or ma'am, is what are you looking for? When you think about the days that are coming in your life, what do you hope for? Mm -hmm. What are you looking for? I'd say to you today, from what I know about my relationship with the Lord Jesus and his word, if you're looking for anything else but him and hoping for anything else but him or pursuing anyone or anything else more than you're pursuing him, then there's something wrong inside of you. Because the truth might be that you really don't know him the way you should know him. Because I know the more you get to know Jesus, the more you want to be with him and the more you want to be knowing about him. Amen. Amen. So ask yourself as we move through uh, this uh, sermon tonight, this message, uh, what are you looking for out of life? I want to speak to you tonight on the subject, the full circle jubilee. Uh, that's where we've come to as we've been looking at these uh, periods of 50 years and on the 50th year uh, was declared a jubilee in Leviticus 25 verses 9 and 10. And if you had lost your land and been thrown into debtor's prison, if you'd been exiled uh, from your family, on the 50th year, it was a year of jubilee, and everything was given back to you. Everything was restored that was originally yours. And we started in 1867. Then last week, if you'll remember, we went all the way back to uh, 67 A.D., right? Or A.D. or B.C., A.D., A.D., after, I always get that mixed up, A.D., 67 years, uh, the first, uh, when, when Rome attacked and invaded Israel and began to disperse the children of Israel, and then uh, the other 50-year increments, and then we made it up to 1867, and we've been studying in-depthly what happened with Israel, what God was doing to bring about and what we've learned is, is that these jubilees on these 50-year periods with the years ending in 67 or, seven, or the year 17 is, uh, is, is kind of a step-by-step -step jubilee. It, they've all been partial jubilees. It's not been a complete circle from everything that's been lost all the way back to everything being restored. So tonight I want you to start thinking along those lines of now that every or it coming to a complete circle and everything being restored. I think you might be surprised at those things that had not been restored already in the Jubilees that we have been looking at, okay? Because the Jubilees don't only concern Israel. They concern the rest of the world. Yes. They, they concern the entire world. Yes. Because really, so goes Israel, as we've learned, so goes the world. Amen? Amen. So... The Lord Jesus, as a matter of fact, speaking of the whole world, one day he will subdue the entire world and bring it back to where it once was, by force, okay? I don't know if you've thought about that, but by force. So we'll look at some of that. At this time in the world's history, uh, the Lord Jesus is physically, he has a human body, there is a human body, uh, the Lord Jesus, who is setting a glorified human body, sitting at the right hand of a God, of God the Father, and functioning as our great high priest. There is a man in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Messiah, you see, who is in heaven now. Now, his spirit, 
He has went back to heaven and he sent forth the Spirit. God the Father has sent forth his Spirit. And his Spirit is working to call those that God has preordained to be called that would believe the message of Jesus Christ and be saved and become a part, be washed up and cleaned up by the blood of Jesus Christ and be presented as the bride of Christ as Jesus will present his bride spotless and blameless before the Father's throne. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing here today. Now, Jesus has went back to heaven from the earth. He came from heaven. You see, he, he did not begin his existence in Bethlehem. Jesus said to the, to the Pharisees and everybody that was listening to him one day, when you see me, you see the Father. I am was before Abraham, you see. Jesus always has been. So he came from heaven, and then he, he, he finished his work that he was assigned to do, and then he was resurrected from the dead, and he went back to heaven. He returned to heaven. But now we are waiting on him to come back again to this earth, and he's going to come two more times. Okay? He's going to come two more times. One time he's going to come in the clouds, mm -hmm. And only the bride will see him Amen. when we are resurrected. Right? When those that are passed away, he's going to bring the souls and spirit with them uh, from heaven into the clouds. Mm -hmm. And we which are alive and remain will be called up together with them because we got to be changed. This body is sin cursed. Mm -hmm. You see, and we're going to get our heavenly bodies at the same time they get theirs. And we're going to go see the Lord in the air. The world won't see him then. Only the church will see him. He's coming as a thief in the night, you see. Yes. So it's like when a thief comes and breaks in your house. He don't want you to see him. He's going to come and take the most precious thing. He, usually he, you don't see a thief putting a refrigerator on his back and carrying it out of the house. He's taking the jewels. He's taking the most precious thing. So the Lord's going to come and get his most precious thing before the tribulation starts, which is his bride, you and me. Now the second time he comes... He will come as the king of kings. He will come and he will sit on the throne of David, you see. He'll come as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And then every eye will see him come, okay? Two different, two different uh, uh, entrances from heaven back to this earth that we are expecting from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we are looking for his return right now. The Bible says that that uh, we ought to be looking and hoping for the blessing of him returning. Amen? Amen. So uh, look now, I want to show you, uh, as, as speaking of the Jubilee, how his <coughs> departing is part of the full circle, full circle Jubilee. Okay? Amen. Now look at Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. <coughs> and we know this is when the Lord uh, ascended back into heaven. Uh, he was there, and there was 400 people there, by the way. It's hard to spread, uh, to, to keep a lie going with two people. The 400 people there that seen the Lord ascend up into the clouds and disappear back into heaven. And it says, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He hit a cloud, and he was gone, Okay. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Angels, of course. All right, that's how they're always identified or most of the time identified, particularly in the New Testament. And then verse 11 says, which also said, ye men of Galilee, this is the angels speaking, why stand you here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So he's saying he's going to come back mm -hmm. just like you've seen him leave. Mm -hmm. Now, what I see in this is I see the two different comings that we're looking for. I can see the rapture in it, and I can also see the second coming when he sets foot on the earth. And I'm going to show you that. Now look at Acts 3, verses 20 and 21. Maybe you hadn't taught this before. Acts chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Speaking of God the Father, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Then he says in verse 21, now get this, Whom the heaven must receive. I love it when it says until. You see that? Until. God's giving me some, a timeline here. All right? 
Heaven must receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And right now he is acting as our great high priest, right? He said, until the times of restitution of what? All things. See, there is a time coming. God already has it scheduled. God already knows when it's going to be. Jesus said he didn't know. He didn't know. The man Jesus didn't know. But God the Father knows the exact day. And God's never late. He's never early. He's always on time. Amen. Amen. But one of these days is going to be the day of restitution of all things. That is when the Jubilee has made a full circle. You see, every Jubilee that we've seen so far is just another step that he's taken with Israel being what they once was. But also what I want you to see tonight is that the Jubilees is going to take all of creation and make it what it once was. Amen? A full circle Jubilee is on the way. Total restitution, total restoration is going to happen. And I believe it's going to happen pretty quick or uh, the next step of it. Amen? We're looking for the next step back to the beginning. Now, the next event on the schedule, I believe, is the rapture. Everybody don't believe or believe the same way as I do, of course, but with their, it's the only way I can get the Bible to make sense dispensationally. Is is here you see the we see the church age, which is the 69th, is a pause between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel's uh, revelation, and then the rapture goes, and uh, at the, and that is the first resurrection we see. And then the seven years of tribulation. Now, we don't know how much time is between the rapture and the tribulation starting. But we know the tribulation starts when the Antichrist signs a peace treaty with Israel. Then it'll be exactly seven years till when the Lord comes back. Okay? Now, if you're here to see all that, I don't plan on being here to see all that because I believe in a pre-wrath rapture. You see? I don't believe that I got engaged with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, for my Lord to start beating on me. That ain't the way the Lord operates, you see. He's going to take his bride up out of the way before he starts pouring his wrath out on this God-rejecting world. Now, so that's when he comes back in the cloud and just the church will see him. All right, so now what we do know is that this seven years, like I just said, that that will bring us down to after the seven years tribulation, then we'll see that is when the Lord comes back in his second coming. You see, at the end of this seven years, and there he will sit on the throne of David and rule and reign, and will rule and reign with him, the Bible says, the saints of God, for a thousand years. And Satan will be bound. Now, what you got to keep in mind is people will be getting born during this thousand years. Everybody will not die during the tribulation. There will be flesh and blood people. We'll be in our glorified bodies. You see, that's why we'll rule and reign with him as priests and kings. If we've been faithful in a little, we'll get a little. If we've been faithful in a lot, then he'll give us a lot of responsibility, you see. So during this thousand years, people will still have, just like Adam and Eve, kind of, Adam and Eve did not have a fallen nature, but they had a free will, and they failed. There was only one thing that God told them they couldn't do, only one rule. Yeah. And they were tricked, Eve was tricked, and Adam got tricked, and they gave in and believed Satan, and they fell. And therefore, all of us that was born from Adam and Eve, which is everybody, was born with a fallen nature. That's why you don't have to teach a kid, Brother John, to lie. They do it naturally, because we're natural born sinners, right? So, during this thousand years, the Lord is going to sit on the throne and then everything, is, then we're going to see the full circle jubilee right here. Right, right, right here. I, this is where I want to take you to tonight, where the millennial starts, and we're going to see the full circle of the jubilee thus far. There's still be a little bit more, but we're getting, you know, the circle comes around, we're getting right up there close to it being the full circle, okay? Now, when Jesus comes back, he's not going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey this time. He's going to ride in on a flying white stallion and we're going to be riding behind him. That's what they always did in olden times when a king would conquer another king, they'd ride in on a white stallion to claim their victory, all right, of triumph, all right? Now the fate of Israel and the fate of the world 
are bound together. I don't know if you've noticed that, but so goes Israel, so goes the world, especially since they've come back. Amen? Amen. And since God has brought them back to their uh, ancestral homeland. Israel's destiny is determined, and I would say revealed, by the Jubilean Mysteries. Mm -hmm. Okay? God is revealing things to us that we didn't know prior to Him bringing them back according to the Word of God as the prophecies were seen being fulfilled through them and through their restoration back to their homeland officially in, in um, uh, May 14, 1948. Okay? The Jubilees involved nations, armies, world leaders, world events, as I've said to you many times before, we can tell time by the nation of Israel. Now, for example, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came preaching in Israel while Rome was the world empire. Remember that? They were the Rome empire, okay, or the world empire. Rome was changed after his resurrection. The Roman empire was changed. The course of, Roman, of the Roman empire's history was changed because the empire was transformed. By Christianity, you see? Mm -hmm. It's faith, it's culture, it's institutions, it's ethics, it's values, it's worldview, how it viewed the world, was changed. The gospel of Jesus Christ, which went out of Jerusalem, changed the Roman history, it changed Western history, and it changed world history. Western civil, now this is very important because it's leading to where we're going to go to after we finish this series here in the next week or two. Western civilization, which is the United States, or some people um, uh, throw in England with that and everything else is East, right? So Western civilization could, has rested upon a biblical foundation. There's great revivals that, set, uh, that went through England and down through Europe, and then that's what brought the Puritans want to get away from the Church of England and being told how to worship, come to America, and America rested upon biblical foundations from its constitution from the founding of it, okay? It would become a civilization that would aspire to biblical values, right? It's hard to see that now. Stay with me. In, uh, the, the United States or the Western culture as a whole embraced biblical faith, biblical values, and held to a biblical world view. Okay? Western culture grew to become a major part of modern civilization and the world culture. Christianity exploded, right? Therefore, Christianity, uh, therefore, biblical values exploded with it. Now, how does this relate to the Jubilee, you might ask? In the Jubilee, you return to the place you once was. Yeah. Okay, stay with me. You return to the original state. To a large degree, the Jubilee in return, the entire world will also return to its original state. Okay? The world must return to where it was in the beginning of the church age, first of all, in order for Israel to return to where she was. Israel is almost there, but they're not, not there all the way yet. Okay, stay with me. She will receive help to get all the way back to where she was before Jesus came. That's where she's headed. She's got to get there before she can move on, right? Full circle. So once we're raptured, once the church is raptured, the Roman Empire, with the Antichrist leading it, will help Israel return full circle to where they were before Christ with temple worship and things like that. That treaty he signs with Israel is for them to do their temple worship mm -hmm. on the mount, okay, on the temple mount. At the end of the Great Tribulation, Israel will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the Tribulation but they will not till the end, okay? Some will, many will, many will. The Roman Empire will return to world power. Now say, hear me now, because we're going to start looking at this in a couple weeks. The Roman Empire will return to world power, false gods and all. And we're already seeing, we're already seeing the false gods being prevalent, and most Christians, including myself, 
We seen the evil, but we didn't know what was behind it. Okay, and these false gods brought certain sins with them that we're going to see that are being practiced in America today. And, and in England, everywhere in the Western culture where Christianity has been so prevalent for so many years. The Roman Empire will return back to world power. Remember we learned that? Okay, and, the, and it, that will be the catalyst of power for the Antichrist. All right, the restored Roman Empire will be without Christianity. Without true Christianity. Back to where it was before Christ. You see that? Yeah. You see it? Mm -hmm. That means Christian influence will begin to fade. So now your lights are going to start coming on. I see, mm -hmm. I see what's going on. That means that Western culture will be, be, become increasingly less Christian. We actually will actually become non Christian. The last generation of the church will witness a departure from biblical foundations. That's what we see going on. A departure from the faith that defined it. Now listen, it ain't real sudden. It's step by step. Step by step. Until we see the seventh church. Remember that? In the Revelation, the seven churches, verses two, uh, chapters 2 and 3. The last one was the church of uh, Thyatira. And God kept on saying, you've jumped into the bed mm. with these false idols and these false gods. So the church that you see that is jumping into bed with untruth and secularism and humanism, you see? Like we see so many that call themselves Christian today compromising. You know you're in the last church. Because they have jumped into bed. It happens without them even knowing what's happening. Because one generation gives a little bit. Then the next generation don't know how it was before that generation gave a little bit. And then they give a lot. And then before you know it, you're three generations, four generations deep. And the kids have never seen the truth. No. All they know is what they've been seeing on TV. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And what they're being told by their friends at school and by the teachers that don't believe in God. We are, we are witnessing a departure from the Word of God, from true spirituality, from morality and ethics, in culture and in worldview right here in the United States. We just seen a rainbow party mm -hmm. on the White House lawn. Who would have dreamed? Mm -hmm. Who would have dreamed we'd see that in the United States? Now we see so much that we've got hardened to it, right? That's right. It's already happening without a doubt. There has been cases when it happens quickly. For an example, the Soviet Union, uh, they took theirs by force, right? They, they took uh, over countries by force, and same way with Nazi Germany. It, it can happen quickly, but most of the time, it happens step by step, slowly, slowly, mm -hmm. one step after another, okay? First, there has to be a step by step dis, uh, disestablishment of biblical authority. Mm -hmm. And one way that this started for 400 years, we had one English-speaking Bible. And now, over the last seven decades, every translation, whoever wants to believe whatever they want to believe, can go to a Bible store and say, well, I don't want this to say what I'm doing is a sin, so I'm going to buy this and over here, it don't say it, right? Mm -hmm. We are changing the Word of God, and the church has ate it like candy. Mm -hmm. It, well, I want to understand. Well, the King James Bible is read on a sixth grade level. You can understand if you try. Mm -hmm. You see, if you just dig and try, you can understand it, right? But we took the easy way out, and, and now there's some, we've changed the Word of God. And that's where Satan attacked Eve at. No, as God said, he really didn't mean that literally, Eve. Mm -hmm. He knows if you eat, the truth is, he knows if you eat off that tree, you'll be like him and be God. See, it's an attack on the word of God. That's why I stick with the old King James Bible. I've seen all the revivals. I've seen the awakenings using that one. And that's the one I'm going to stick with. 
You do what you want to, but we're going to have to answer to God for one day. And I know he's used that one, so I'll just stick with that one. Amen? Amen. I know a lot of other things about it, but I ain't got time to talk about it. <laughs> we are witnessing a step-by-step de-Christianization of our culture. We cannot believe what we're seeing. Can't believe the stuff that we see on the steps of the courthouses and what people are protesting for. Sin. Protesting for the right to sin, and don't tell me I'm not sinning, right? Right. And kids believe this is a normal behavior because they've never seen nothing else. Mm -hmm. What's this generation that's coming up now going to be like? Mm -hmm. Who's not seen the truth, had not had an example. We're seeing a removal, my friends, in America, and the leader of Western culture, we are seeing the removal of the Word of God, yeah. of the authority of the Word of God. We're seeing our the virtues from the word of God being overturned, our values being overturned, the purging of God's name. It's almost taken us back to where it was before Jesus came to Rome, right? It's going back that, it's going back that way. You say, well, yeah. what about the revivals we're seeing? Praise God, I hope he delays it. I'd love to see America come back to God. I'd love to see a revival, but I believe in my heart from everything else we've seen and with Israel becoming a nation that God is just reaching down and taking another harvest, one last harvest before he takes the church out of here. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. Because only 4%, only 4% of kids under 25 identify themselves as having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mercy. He's dealing with young people. And I'm glad to see it. Amen? Amen. But us old people could use some, some of God too. Amen? Yeah. Preacher, when did this begin in America? When did this step-by-step -step decline away from Christianity in America begin? Well, just so happens it began at the same time Israel became a nation. You see, that's the cantilever. That's the catalyst yes. that started everything in motion. That's when the big old snowball or the little snowball got pushed off the top of the big old hill and it's got bigger and bigger, you see. Mm -hmm. After World War II, in the 1940s, when the boys came home from the war, everything started being different. And the reason for that was God had made us a world power mm -hmm. almost overnight. Right. He took Britain out of the way because they started fighting Israel, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so now... The greatest, biggest empire there ever was, the British Empire, was removed. And almost overnight, the United States became a world power. All of a sudden, we only had to work five days a week. Uh, Eight hours a day. That's like not even working at all. Right? <laughs> From what we was used to. And all of a sudden, we had money. We had cars. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a car. Everybody could get a house. People even had enough free time because of appliances. They have vacations. Amen. And what happened was, once, once you get on top, it is the most dangerous place to be as a human being. Because then you start seeking other things beside God because you got everything. You see? You start seeking pleasure. You start seeking entertainment. Huh? You start, you start seeking excitement. You start seeking money all the time. Chasing money all the time, right? That's when things start started to change and the moral fabric of the family began to break down. And one of the biggest reasons that we have ever, the society we have is because of men not being the husbands and the dads that we ought to be. Mm -hmm. You see, kids don't need two mamas. Kids don't need two daddies. Kids need mama and daddy. Mm -hmm. Especially daddy. Especially daddy. A, a house is not a home without mama. Mama's the heart. But dad is the authority. Dad is the one that the kids ought to fear and respect and honor and love. But there's got to be some fear there. I was always had a respect, respectful fear with my dad. And he was drunk every day of my childhood. Mm -hmm. One reason was I know he'd smack me in the mouth if I said something I shouldn't say. Mm -hmm. I ain't saying that is what ought to happen. But that's one reason I feared him. Right? Mm -hmm. But there ought to be that reverence and fear that you don't want to let your daddy down right. because he's living a godly yes. example before you. Amen? Amen? Western civilization is falling into paganism as the world was before Jesus Christ, step by step by step. And people say, well, you're just a fatalist. Well, I think I'm a realist. Mm -hmm. I watch the news. Amen? Mm -hmm. I see what's going on. 
You see, when the pilgrims came, this was a pagan land. And they brought Christianity here and swept out the house. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, when you sweep out the house, if you don't fill it with something else, then the demon will come back and bring seven friends with him. Mm -hmm. And what is happening now, see, the, the, they swept out the house and Christ was in it, but now Christ is being pulled out and Satan is finding angles and ways to get in. Mm -hmm. Right? Through Hollywood, through the universities, through cults and every false teaching under the sun. And this country is falling into paganism more and more and more. What if, if, if this is happening with the church here, how quick is it going to happen when the church is gone? Mm -hmm. Amen? That's right. When any civilization departs from Christianity and biblical values, it will return back to a pagan civilization. That's right. And that's why it's not straight, uh, safe to walk down our streets at night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our kids don't understand. Our grandkids don't understand. Chelsea, Chelsea has no idea the childhood that you and I had. Right. Right. That we, we could leave our doors open. Mm -hmm. We could walk down the street on a busy highway. Little boys and little girls are not worried about nobody bothering us. Mm -hmm. You see, everything has changed so dramatic. We go on vacation and leave our house unlocked. It ain't like that no more. I right. make sure mine's locked up like Fort Knox before I go to bed. Right. Mm -hmm. Children, listen, in a pre-Christ world of paganism, children were killed in their mother's wounds. And also we see a return to pagan culture in America as the way that we view sexuality, biblical gender roles and assignments, and the institution of marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first century pagan culture was not only non-Christian, it warred against Christians and Christianity. Yeah. Okay? That's where we're going. That's where we're going step yeah. by step. Today we see a war against the Word of God. Next we're going to see a war against Christians. Mm -hmm. yes. Especially those that stand up for the Word of God. Yeah. Yes. Amen? Yes. And that's what God's calling us to do, by the way. Yes. Amen. You see, a return to Rome killed Christians. Rome killed Christians for sport. Mm -hmm. Rome was also an anti-Israel empire as well. The Bible teaches that at the end of this age, the church age, the nations of the world will gather to battle against Israel. Ezekiel 37, 38, and Zechariah 14, and other mm -hmm. places. And we see those nations already aligned yeah. and surrounding Israel. Yeah. Jew, Jerusalem will be the center of world controversy, and it already has yes. mm -hmm. in our lifetime. Without the Jews returning to Israel, none of this is possible. Think about it. Right. If the Jews never come back, none of this would be going on. Right. Everything centers on Israel's return to its original possession. Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Definition of a jubilee. Christianity is directly tied to the nation of Israel. I never have thought about these kind of things. Listen to this. Christianity is a faith based or birthed in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about mm -hmm. that. 2,000 years ago, Christianity went from Jerusalem to the nations of the world. Yes. Christianity is a universal faith, but it's well, as well a Jewish faith first. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't look at it like that, do we? Yeah. Christianity was born on Jewish soil founded on the Jewish hope, built on the Jewish scriptures, and centered on the Jewish Messiah. Mm -hmm. It was a radical faith, and it was a revolutionary faith. It was su supported only by itself. It was not state-sponsored, mm -hmm. but just on the word of a man based, or a woman based, or backed up by the Spirit of God. But the status quo battled against it. Christianity was born out of persecution. And we will return to it in many parts of the world already are. Yeah. I imagine our brother John could tell us some things yes. about that. Mm -hmm. On its own, it overcome an empire and changed the course of human history. Now, the Christian faith was never meant to stay within the borders of its homeland. It was born to transcend and go out to the world. So yes. Jesus and his, told his disciples to go to the ends of the earth, right? Amen. And proclaim Amen. the gospel. But eventually, the branches lost their connection to the roots, which we talked about last week. And then the church has lost its Jewish roots. In time, the church became a part of Rome and the Western civilization. At the same time, 
all the more estranged from her Jewish origins and from the Jewish people. I mean, how many times do you hear a pastor in the average church get up and talk about our Jewish origins and where we come from? Never. What was born in Jerusalem would soon become part of the Roman Empire and the Gentile world. Now, there was a departure of the church from its original place and people. Now, stay with me. Stay with me now. Everybody wake up. I'm going to put everybody to sleep. Stay with me now because this is where I wanted to get you. You see, we've departed from our Jewish roots. Christianity has to go back mm -hmm. to the Jewish roots. Therefore, Christianity, the church, you see, when we departed, we, we become exiled from our ancestry, our home, our roots, our possession. The church parallels the exile of the Jewish people. The Jewish people became increasingly separate, separated from its ancestral land. The church has become increasingly separated from its ancestral roots, okay? The jubilee is to gain back the original possession. Israel, along with gaining back the land, it also has to gain back Christianity, okay? The church must now return to her roots. The first century church, there, uh, which was there in Israel, the church was attached to Israel. It must return, uh, and the tribulation, now here, here's something you might not have heard, the tribulation church, okay? There'll be people that's getting saved during the tribulation, but they'll be mostly Jewish people. Mm -hmm. that's right. There's going to be 144,000 preaching virgin men for one thing. And I believe it's uh, 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 Moses. Who was the other one always? Uh, Elijah. Moses said Elijah will be witnessing, get killed on the streets, and resurrected in front of the whole world. A lot of Jewish folks are going to get saved during the tribulation yes. before as a nation they come. Okay? So it's got to come full circle. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I said too much. I went too long on this, so I'm going to wrap it up real quick. The faith has returned to Jerusalem, as we learned last week, right? Mm -hmm. Over 100 churches in, in, in Israel right now of Jews being saved, Christian churches. So today, God is calling us as Christians to come out of the status quo. Mm -hmm. I feel it. It's as real as it can be. God wants us, Sister Karen, to be radical. Not violent, but radical in our faith. Radical in our love for Yeshia. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Rad radical in our devotion to his word and for the true way of salvation. Radical leaving the worldliness that is incorporated into the church of Thyatira that we find ourselves living in. We need to throw off some stuff. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. Here's a picture of the first church. See if you recognize this church. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, speaking of Peter, say on the day of Pentecost, saying, Save yourselves from this unto a war generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there was added unto them 3,000 souls. Just a couple days later, they go walking up to the temple, Peter and John do, and this crippled guy gets healed. The Lord heals this crippled guy, and 5,000 people get saved at the temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, so verse 42, verse 43, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul. There is no fear of God on our church anymore. Right. It's not there. Nope. It's not there. I fear him. Because I've been in the woodshed with him before and don't want to go there again. Amen? Amen? I fear him greatly and respect and reverence him because it's all out of love, right? But we need some fear on us. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Stay with me now. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to every man and every man that had a need. There it is. There's that reckless abandonment that the Lord is first. Listen, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were in the temple with no fear. They wasn't huddled up in some room, hiding. They got full of the Holy Ghost and they went out on the streets, brother, and they went in the temple and started preaching the word of God. We don't have that on us no more. We'll huddle in our churches. We'll huddle in this room. But we ain't busting out where they are, right? And preaching mm -hmm. 
because we're more afraid of God than we are of people. Amen. And look here, they were praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Mm -hmm. Can you see that kind of radicalism on our church today? No, we see the opposite. Materialism. Huh? Mm -hmm. but everybody, not everybody, but so many chasing the dollar. But that's the first thing on their heart, right? Yeah. Chasing pleasure, chasing entertainment, chasing everything but the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he says, return to your first love. Mm -hmm. You remember what he told the rich young ruler, Pam? Give everything you got away. Mm -hmm. Sell it, give it to the poor, or whatever. Mm -hmm. He walked away sorrowful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you do, sir? You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. I got to ask myself the question, what if God told me to give all my stuff away today? What would I do? Huh? Wherever your treasure is, is where your heart is. Mm -hmm. Paul was rich and he became poor because that's what God told him to do. Listen, I don't believe that God has told you to give all your stuff away necessarily. He don't tell every Christian that. But if he did, what would you do? You see, you don't have to, but what if he wanted you to? Are you willing? That's the kind of radicalism I'm talking about that abandonment of all worldly things where he's first and whatever he wants, that's what I'll do. I'm here to tell you, that's where I am, Denise. Whatever the Lord wants, that's what I want to do. Nancy, you better get ready. We might end up, we might end up homeless, amen? <laughs> God, listen, God knows your heart. He knows if you love somebody or something else more than you love him. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to skip on down here. The Lord said that he, or the Lord is the king, right? The king of the universe. Now, Pilate put this sign, in slide 11, this sign over Jesus' cross. Okay? And in John 19, verses 19 and 20, the Bible says, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title... Then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus, Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, and in Greek, and in Latin. Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now see, when he ascended back to heaven, all right, I'm closing it up. When he ascended back to heaven, you see, he left his kingdom. The king left his kingdom. And now, where's the kingdom he left? Okay, until 1948, Israel was gone. The temple was gone, right? The, the Jewish people were gone. Jerusalem was gone. The church got born there. Then it was gone. You see, the kingdom left because the king left. Right. Mm -hmm. But then look what it says in John 1, 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So the creator left, right? He left his creation. But we pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, right? Yes. So Revelation eleven fifteen says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of his world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. Amen. You see, Jesus, Yeshua, departs Jerusalem, and so does everything else, but he's coming back to it, okay? The Jubilee, the Jubilee says that everything's got to go back to the way it was. Look at Zechariah 14, 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Now this, this is when he comes back from heaven with the saints, with the angels. And I've been to the Mount of Olives here, and a lot of times that he, Jesus and the disciples would sleep here on this mount amongst the olive trees. And you can see there's a valley, the Kidron Valley in between uh, the Mount of Olives, and here is the Temple Mount because we see this mo Muslim mosque which was built where the temple was, mm -hmm. and it has that golden dome. They call it the Dome of the Rock, and you see the wall that goes around Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, if I understand the scriptures right, it says here in Zechariah 14, 4, that he's going to, after he destroys Satan's armies, he's going to land here with his horse, Okay, with this white stallion, Amen. and we're all going to line up, 
All right, mm -hmm. and he's gonna march down. He's gonna ride that horse down through here and come through the gate there. And he's gonna go to the new built temple. And there he's gonna be uh, uh, coronated, you see, as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we're gonna receive our position. He's gonna ride, he rode out on the donkey, but or he rode in on the donkey the first time. But next time he's coming in on the flying white stallion mm -hmm. to complete, you see, oh, yeah. by force. Amen. By force, he's going to rule and reign on this earth, Amen. okay, Amen. for a thousand years. God. And we're going to be doing it with him. We'll, we'll rule and reign. So if you suffer with me, you'll rule with me. Amen. Amen. Let me show you a few pictures just to think about. I didn't know it was going to take me this long. Just, just an artist rendering of what it might be like when people repent before the Lord as he's on his throne here in glory and then you see the angels around him there on his throne. Uh, I, I tried to find a better picture, but that, that should get in your mind. Look at the next picture. The Bible says that during this time that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth like the water covers the sea. He's going to be teaching. Mm -hmm. He's going to be laying down the law, mm -hmm. you see? And he's going to be enforcing the law. There will be justice. There will be righteousness, and all people, all people will see and know the law. Mm -hmm. Now look at the next slide. And the earth, now, now get this, the Bible says the lion will lay down with the lamb. I run you all five pages of verses about what's going to go on in the millennium, but I say mm -hmm. them because I might want to talk about them next week. But anyway, it's going to be like it was back in the Garden of Eden. Man, man had dominion over the animals. I believe that man could control the temperature, had dominion over all of creation, you see. And that's where it's going back. You see all this coming back? See this, this, this time dispensational chart? It's all a big circle. It is circled back now to the Garden of Eden, all the way back to the beginning, you see. Now look at the last picture, and I'm done. Here in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> You see the Lord Jesus, remember? He would come walking down in the cool of the evening. And they see Adam and Eve. They weren't ashamed of being naked. Sin hadn't entered in, okay? And we, we won't have sin because we'll have our glorified bodies. Our, our old nature dies with our body. But you see, the Lord will have fellowship face to face. And we don't have any fear. The climate is perfect. Every, every need is supplied. And there's all the... There's all, Tiger, no worries. See, everything is going back to the way that it was. That's why the Lord gave Israel the Jubilee, so that we could see that's where we're headed as well. Amen? Amen. Back to where it all started. My friends, you say, well, that sounds pretty fanciful and a pretty made-up story. Well, if you really got to studying and you've been watching up to now, you'll see that God gave prophecies hundreds of years ago, even thousands, and we have seen them come true and materialize in our lifetime. Yes. Mm -hmm. And no prophecy is yet to be fulfilled that needs to be fulfilled before Jesus comes back as far as I can find. So that's what we're looking for. He just keeps intensifying the prophecies that he's given us so we'll wake up and see. Oh, you want to be on the right side of this. So I implore you to repent. And I could not ask you or no one else could ask you to repent without telling you of the promise of the Holy Spirit who once you have repented and turned to God from a godly sorrow of your sins and asking for forgiveness, the Holy Spirit, God himself, will come live in you and you'll have somebody living in you that wants to do right. Amen. Amen. And can give you the power to do right. A lot of people don't repent because they think they got to do it on their own. And we do them no justice by telling them to repent without giving them the promise of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you come? Will you come tonight? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, whosoever will, call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Will you do it? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I've been long tonight. And God, there was just so much to say. But I just thank you for all the patience of the people that are here. For they want to learn. And they want to grow. And I hope that even though now they might not remember everything that was said, as they leave here, I pray your spirit would bring it back to their remembrance as life goes on. For it is an assured hope that you're bringing all things to yourself and that you will subdue all kingdoms just like you said that you would. 
God, it would suit me just fine mm -hmm. if you come right now. Amen. Yes. You come right now. Yes. Lord, we thank you for the assured promise of your word. And we thank you for the presence of your spirit, which is a pledge, a promise, a down payment that we indeed are saved. Thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, beloved.